being the meeting, it is 1.24, even if it's after the 120 mark, but um, start when you have a few few things that you can remote desktop share. Mm -hmm. So, and this is I haven't yet question. Yeah, logged into the remote desktop, but the question was asked before break, you know, how, how much land are we talking about, which is in the current uh, proposed mitigation okay. Um, mitigation plan area that, that would see implementation of the plan. So, um, if I go to our GIS uh, page on our website, this will. Um, and if I don't do it from here, I, I might have to remote desktop. But I, I haven't used the tools on this one as as much as I have the That's Google fine. Earth from my office. So let me, let me just. Pull up the comprehensive plan real quick too. Um, let me take a second to load it. But um, so this is the page, and that's not is it? Is it? Huh? That's so this is, that this is oh yeah, it is one. Okay, there you go. Um, I'm not sure. It, it probably wants to highlight text and this won't highlight text. So, yeah, I'll zoom in in just a second. Let me make this a little thicker and then draw on this a little more. So, the question that you were, oops, that went too far. You could yeah. turn down the opacity on that, Darwin. Yeah, let me erase it. Um, so, this is a question. At least you guys saw it. This is the, you know, draw an outline of it. Um, the area that we're talking about for RR was this area, which extends from um, this is Will Bridge, this is Route Hill Road, prison would be roughly there, and then this is the junction. Can you um, zoom in on that more? Yeah, let me um, get to this. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so 140 is. Right there off yep. that so little leg. Um, the RR um, goal accepted area extends currently into you know just past the junction and what would be a portion of the Duvaru site. So from um, not not the panel site but where the mitigation portion would be. So current uh, zoning on this, this is the the map that I have online it right. shows um, zoning has already taken place on a portion of what was in the map on page 17. And then um, the comprehensive plan, again, shows that, that same area. However, from what the, the map on page 17, again, which I'm not 100% sure is the most you know, correct and up, up uh, to date, but the measurement, if we uh, try to pull um, a polygon, the whole area um, would have been from uh, no, down. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, so that is right close to what would be on page, found on page 17. Uh, that is a total ac acreage area, again, not on the survey, but a, a 453 acres, which I believe in the comprehensive plan is probably one of those um, parcels, either one or two. Now, they just want to flip to it. Um, there's a, there was a number of parcels that were identified as goal exception areas already. Um, that's not. That's just the RR rural residential. It's not counting the future farm residential to the north. Right. Yeah. That's it. That, and I could draw that as a separate. You know, thing, but that that area probably wouldn't put that far right here, and then you know, some portion so right of this would be considered as that far. That now. range land that's right there. So, so if I leave this, and, you know, just that thought in your mind. Now we'll, we'll go back to you know drawing a measurement for what is currently Duru property within this same um, RR designated, which. And I'm going to need to verify that that's still the case. There could have been a plan change after that, but we're we're roughly talking about if I went from these where these 
lots were created as three acre lots, which now makes me believe that that was recognized by a previous planning commission as, as an R, even though it never ended up on any maps. And I brought my map. Well, there's one, one house out there already. And one house. Um, but there's two lots. And, and there's two other lots. To the three north lots total. To the, three acres. to the north of that house, they've dug septic test sites. Yeah, they have. So I've seen them. <clears throat> so, if that's 36 acres, then take out those three um, three acre lots. So nine nine acres, were, you know. 30. And I think I went a little bit wider on this, but roughly we're talking about yeah. Um, 20, well, 20, no, that's the the future farm. No, this is the RR oh. on page 17, which again we need to verify. Because right. the future farm ones were that house sets and the ones north of it are 10 acres. Yeah, this this area where you know, including Durbo, Maxwell's, others, anybody really out here would be ten acre lots um, that would require you know a goal exception. Now, you know, if I but click around any of these lots, north of that house, I used to be Bar Banks. I don't know who lives there now, but north of that house, um, there's other lots where they've done septic. Just, yeah, right here. Right, yeah, the Millers own it now, and and own the and that was and that Julian owns two of those lots. Yeah, and those are ten acres two. also. Yeah, these ones against the highway right here. Yeah, no, they're, they're three acre lots. Well, according to the RR, which is a three acre map. I'm, I'm talking north of that house, where it would be the future farm residential. Uh, can you? I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, future farm residential is really anything out here that gets a goal exception, but. Knowing that it hasn't, but I'm assuming that house north of the 2040. I'm not well, sure which house you're talking about. Well, it's tax about. lot 2605, it's the most northern one. It's a three acre lot. Yeah. Both of these have had site evaluations done on them. This is the only house that currently is there with Millers. They're all oh. three acre lots. And those are north of the ski hill road. Yes, 140. Yeah. And if I zoom in even further and try to get you know, the most accurate, you know, measurement, you know, to try to figure out where, um, maybe I should, you know, go around these, but knowing that they're each roughly three acres each, where, you know, considering that that's the width that we see on that, you know, um, on page 17. We're talking 30, yeah, 33 acres minus those nine or 24 acres. So, you know, that then, you know, and again, I'm, I'm absolutely <laughs> suggesting that if, if you put in a condition that talks about this mitigation plan, that it excludes that area. So 25 acres, we need to go to another location. Whether that means they acquire more land or it's part of the 40, roughly, and we can go back and pull a measurement of what's what's on the west side of, of this that they took out that you know, this is this is more probably more than 40 um, that's cool. so oops so if I you know, just draw around this what what potentially could be mitigation you know this will this is always Tough where that might go. I mean, maybe it goes all the way actually to the boundary. That's probably where it go, where those panels would be over here. So it's actually more. So you're you're talking roughly 60 acres that they gained by not putting panels in this location. You know, minus that 25, we're still at plus 35, and then whatever else you have to come up with. Um, if you went to the two to one, uh, and whatever they haven't applied yet. But I mean, that that's definitely a gain of 60. There's a loss of 25 according to map on, on page 17. Um, no, but again, the, the habitat mitigation agreement has been made, it's just where that would be implemented and the implementation of that wasn't secured yet, which we've heard testimony of. They've secured most of it because most of it was on the east side of the property, yes, but in the highway, but you know, ending at the, where the panels would be located, roughly. And we can pull measurements on that too, again, to just to refresh you on how far away from the road, most of those panels would be. Um, you know, if I look at feet and distance, you know, from just going down 
those panels are going to be starting somewhere around here. The fence line, if I drew that in, would obviously follow this. The, the ridge there would, it appears as a ridge, but um, so that's not four something's five not correct. Feet. Oh, on something, no, something's not correct. What's it on there? I don't know why it's showing. Is that is way more than 5,000 feet. Yeah, well, it's way less than 5,000 feet. Yeah, it's way less. It was only, it was like seven feet. Yeah. Let me close it this way. That's getting closer. I'm not sure why that's doing that. Um, but again, I mean, to it was somewhere around 1700 from what I remember in the past, and then it, it does get a little more narrow when you get down closer to the headquarters. Um, but I think it was still over a thousand feet away from the road. Yeah, again, question. That's definitely yeah. Was that borrowing them up? Yeah. Sure. See, that's the question that's been brought up in, in our conversation and discussion. But, isn't necessarily the solar panels being close to the highway. It's the fact that wildlife is being pushed. So again, I'm not, I'm not going to try to talk for ODFW and John Muir, but if they agreed to that's, that location as part of their the implementation plus. area, they must have felt some sense of, well, we're not endangering the, you know, uh, wildlife more. That's not. That's not. <laughs> I mean, there, there's probably some hazard currently, obviously, with you know, strike hazard with the road. And nobody obviously wants to. Yeah. Did we yeah, did you ask? Sure. Can you? I for guess clarification, for sure. clarification, I mean, it's already, we have a mitigation agreement in place. I guess you could ask for clarification from Mr. Muir uh, as far as that, but I, I think it oh, really right. does border, it pushes you know, an opinion. Mr. Bailey? Yeah. Can I ask a clarification question to John Muir, who's Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife? Um, you can, uh, but then you would have to allow the applicant to respond to whatever information you get. I mean, that's where we are with a lot of this right now, is. Um, uh, I think you're likely, procedurally, you're likely to have to allow a, con uh, a continuance of the hearing, an adjournment and a continuance, so that um, uh, the applicant will have the opportunity to respond. Yeah. That's the safest thing to do in terms of preventing uh, an easily avoidable issue on appeal for Luba. Because, because it brings in Mr. Muir's opinion of what that might actually be. And uh, if he could point us to something that's already in the record, correct? If there was anything yeah, that could was also on that you know, A general understanding way. of how those negotiations work and why that area was looked at as, as the best for mitigation implementation. Um, well, let me be clear about this. Uh, what we've done uh, so far is we've had uh, other comments and some questions from the board uh, that was left to the applicant, the applicant was provided the opportunity to respond. I think if you're going to go into these other areas, it's really the same situation. You're going to bring in additional information and the applicant needs to have a chance to respond to that. And how soon, if we do a continuance, do we, can we have that next meeting? Could it be Friday at 10 or maybe it can't be tomorrow with the holiday and it could be less than 24 hours from my understanding. So. Yeah. If we could get a rebuttal or clarification. Well, it all depends on how complicated the question is, but I don't think this is particularly complicated. This is not a lot of new information. It doesn't need to be fine for a lot of stuff. So, all right, I think 48 hours should work. That would be fair and reasonable, is my point. Okay. I think. Mr. It's worth Mayor. asking. Huh? Feel it's worth asking. If you well, I've it. asked him before in public comment. Yeah. So I know it's in there. Um, he told us in the last meeting that it would push the animals closer to the road. That was in public comment prior. How hard would it be to find that? 
Hang on, I got it here. Yeah. Pretty proficient with that thing. That's the reason I don't have one. <laughs> Gosh, I remember that comment too. One of these days, you know, payback. It's going to happen. Um, <laughs> John, okay, so there is a, actually, I, I believe this was um, Brad and Diane Allen that gave comment. Um, John Muir from ODFNW has stated that the project will affect wildlife, should uh, um, will affect wildlife, should not have to move since they were here first. Okay, so no, that's not the same project. That's it's not on the exact same topic. It's similar, but it's not there. No, it's towards the end of the meeting. Yeah. Hang on. One it's not. <clears throat> I think it might be in the applicant's rebuttal. There might be a little bit in there, but I'm not sure. I'm finding John Moore's actual. Or maybe they just, you know, for once, they didn't quote John Muir. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure. Well, I, I write emails all the time to say, tell everyone John Muir said so. So, <laughs> get a little chuckle out. <laughs> uh, I mean, we can we can come back to this if I find it. Um, if there's additional, you know, maybe another subject that we want to touch on. Well, thanks, Darwin, for yeah. looking that up. Um, I'd love to show you my <laughs> book that I came into the office with. I mean, it doesn't even show the RR zone at all on the big books that I'm using. And so I, I remember finding it a couple of years into it when we probably did a lot line adjustment up there. And realized, wait a second, you know. But, uh, yeah, there's definitely inconsistencies. It's partly why I've been pushing for years to get a TIS coordinator. Make the maps. We're yeah, trying to get another job. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> Not my job. Okay. <laughs> no comment. Wow. You didn't need to say anything on that one. It is not. <coughs> so I'm not seeing anything, um, any comment from the FNW, at least in this document. It could be in another document here, and I can pull it forward. But um, no for a fact, well, it, it wasn't in Blue Marmots uh, and the applicant's rebuttal. They don't reference it. So I'm just going to go back over here to the other documents. There was comment um, given from Mrs. Stancliffe uh, that the fence along that, that was going to be built would force migration routes towards the highway. And and she also stated that local studies have not adequately analyzed the impacts of solar development on birds. So, I guess we need to hear, do we need to ask Blue Marmot um, whether they feel comfortable with this new information? I guess we needed them to have a chance for a vote. Is that what we're saying? I think that's the right place to go. 
yeah. due to mitigation acres and this rural residential piece that's come about. And allow for uh, 48 hours for a rebuttal. Is that sufficient enough, I suppose, would be kind of a question. On some of the things that we raised today and, uh, and some of the topics that have come up, the question is whether or not we have, would 48 hours be sufficient for the applicant to rebut or respond to some of the questions that have come about today. Could you clarify what the procedure would be going forward? Rebuttal is well, public see, public comment is closed. Correct. But there's been a number of questions that have been raised here. And Jim Bailey, you can help me out here if you if if you could. But the question the question as I understand it is is 48 hours sufficient to allow for a rebuttal of some of the topics that have been brought up in the meeting today for an actual response? And my question is, what would happen after that rebuttal? So we would we would still, basically, we'd be continuing. This would be a continuance. So we've been, we've been, we've been being the next um, uh, time set for the meeting, and it would just be the same meeting we're having now, trying to move for the decision. But if you supply the rebuttal by, you know, by 10 a.m. or something, and they reviewed your rebuttal, if it was not lengthy, they could still make a decision, say, whenever that new date would be, the same day. I mean, if you provide it before the date in which they schedule the meeting, they could still make a decision when they meet again. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm trying to get clarification on, is is there a reason for a 48-hour rebuttal timeline if the next meeting is not going to be for two oh. weeks oh good right. oh, yeah. good question yeah. okay so maybe it would be good for us to clarify exactly okay are we actually talking about a, a continuance and when would be the earliest date for a continuance and why <clears throat> well we're not going to be well, the only reason for the 48 hours right. is just the assumption that it wouldn't take long to respond if uh, applicant feels oh, that that's good. not enough time to respond to this issue then that's a different matter but uh, mr right. bailey Tim mcmahon here if i could ask a question it's not clear to me what the scope or rationale is for rebuttal. Is it only to uh, respond to something that John Muir might or might not say here, or is, is there some suggestion that's a broader level of rebuttal which um, you know, has its own risk? I if think. the applicant doesn't feel like there's anything for them to rebut or respond to, then that's fine. I think the option has just been kind of put out there, being that we've had a lot of comment and, uh, or a lot of discussion among the board today and there has been a few things the points that have been raised um, and, I, and I guess it'd be more of a question for the applicant whether or not you guys would like some time to rebut anything or respond to anything um, beyond just clarifications and the only thing that I've heard that sounds like new information is the opinion or the information you get from Mr. Um, but we haven't know. actually asked that question right uh, but everything else so far is simply doing uh, research that all was done based on what's in the record and what the statutes are. Correct. So that's new information, and I don't think it would be appropriate to have a rebuttal to any of that. Thank you, Mr. Brady. That's a clarification I need. Appreciate it. You're welcome. My question more so was to Blue Marmot with the information on rural residential, and that wasn't. Uh, available to you beforehand, but it's just been discussed today. Does that affect your habitat mitigation plan? Are you willing to build less acres or less megawatts if it does affect you? It does, does it anyway, does it affect uh, how we decide today by what you've heard? Does that make sense? Mr. Bailey, I'm not sure if this is appropriate. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're going beyond the scope of reviewing the application and making the keep on the application. So for, for me too, I mean, one of the concerns we had was, you know, the applicant addresses and, and the proposed finding addresses that this is a comprehensive plan designated area of agriculture and and where it's been found that according to that it's range so that's one of the one of the other issues i mean some of these other goals and policies within the goals that that have been brought up uh, by commissioner albertson if there's no finding in them the applicant should have been you know allowed to rebut that if, if it was relevant and, and so 
and, and we we have referenced a few other ORSs that I don't believe we've made findings for. So it just that, that's why I just wondered if the applicant wanted more time to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, moving this record forward, you know, pending an appeal, they should have addressed all the criteria, the issues that were raised, and you know, some of them were, were raised last week or the week before by this board. That I just thought that you know, knowing that if this goes to Luba, Luba has remanded when we don't address you know certain issues. Uh, so, so, so I'm just just thinking maybe it would be simpler, and you know, and, and again, it goes kind of back to do we really need an okay and a thumbs up from the applicant on our determination. If we determine that we don't that mitigation isn't appropriate on rural residential, then we just say your mitigation cannot be on that rural residential, you have to find it somewhere else. And so it's just a condition of approval at that point. And, and for right. that issue I agree with you, but but if there's other criteria that wasn't addressed in their application or in their findings that they have they weren't aware of, then they should be allowed the opportunity to respond to that. And, you know, to deny it based upon the, that new information to me seems, you know, like it's going outside of what the, the applicant would need to respond to. Them. It's not really new information, is the way I look at it. Yeah. That on their application, they state that they'll go through all the local planning law. It's in there. And it states in there, in verbiage, it's in there. Plus, it's on the map that's in there. And so, so we made a finding based on the material that's already in the record and before us. Um, and we and out of that will likely come a condition if approved. If denied, however, which is what you just talked about, Darwin, um, what you're saying is if it were to be denied based on that fact, there should be time for the applicant to be able to mitigate that problem. And not just a flat out denial. Is that what you're saying? That's just from my experience with Luba, that's what they're going to want to know that the applicant was awarded. I mean, that's part of what their appeal would be if they if they get denied and they go to Luba. Like they and weren't say, given the opportunity we to remedy This was new issue. criteria that the Board of Commissioners brought up in their deliberation meeting. We didn't have a chance to go over it. Then, then that would be grounds for the at a minimum, right. for them to remand it to, but that's only us based on uh, on a denial. To allow the yeah, based I, I around that, yeah. that 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 piece, absolutely right. But well, if it, it could also potentially be mitigated, but it's still at some point condition. ought to be addressed because it could be it could be approved and then appealed right. still. And if it wasn't addressed, we will remand it to us and say you need to address, you know, allow the applicant to address these these new issues, and I'm not trying to say it's new, but it, you know, it may appear to be new if they haven't addressed it. Or if they weren't aware of it before. Yeah, if they weren't aware of it. I mean, and we only just policies that they may now. feel didn't apply. They, they picked policies that they felt applied directly, um, and if they, you know, things have been you know, uh, used from the comprehensive plan that, that didn't, uh, weren't addressed by the <coughs> application, then is it something that Ought to be addressed, and that's all I'm saying. Gotcha. But the applicant may totally disagree with you. I just thought as a planner of seeing Luba decision come back to us, they remand it if it hasn't been addressed sufficiently, too, you know, substantially in the record. So. Oh man, these guys are biting their tongue. No. <laughs> does that does that help? Well, I think more. I think Gerber's making a valid point. I guess I'm throwing it out to the applicant. Is there any rebuttal you'd like to make? Um, so, what are the criteria that have not been addressed? You know, um, and Darwin, could you clarify whether a difference between whether it's R or A? You know, if there was an yeah. error in some of our rebuttal documents on what the comp plan designation was, does that change the approval criteria? Does that demonstrate that we have not addressed those criteria? Um, I think we need much more clarity on the board's position before I can respond to that question, Commissioner Schlopper. So, uh, just to respond to that, okay. you know, some of my notes reference ORSs, 
that Commissioner Alberton brought up that I don't remember seeing, and maybe they're there as part of the findings document that's been prepared or even in the application, which is referenced in the finding document, um, section 4.1 and, and 5.1, I believe, or the reference in the findings document that's been presented. So if, you know, if we went back through all the notes um, and issues that were raised, I just, um, for process sake, I want to make sure that they were addressed adequately. And if it's something that's, you know, doesn't apply, um, although it was read and from our comp plan, but it's, it's in context to something else, then, then I think it, either I myself could respond or the applicant could respond. But um, ultimately, it's the applicant's, you know, burden proof to show that they met the criteria right. um, to you to then either agree with or disagree with. And um, now, and again, like some of this. I, I think some of the confusion, if I can just touch on this a little bit, um, because we're dealing with a mitigation plan that we haven't fully seen yet, as far as you know, some of the additional mitigation that hasn't actually, it's not in front of us quite yet. Is that correct, Darwin? The mitigation plan has been agreed upon. No, the mitigation plan has been agreed upon. The implementation upon. area has the been implementation been area. Down. Yes. Right. Yes. But so a condition in that's in the that, proposal from the Planning Commission in their recommendation, yeah. it's 15 through 17, covers all the, the you know, unfinalized you know, uh, issues with the mitigation plan that will have to be finalized right. prior to construction. But some of this is on land that is uh, yep. that has not been purchased yet by the applicant in order to be used for that mitigation plan and a portion of that we have discovered through findings is is zoned rural residential so we're saying that that portion can't be used for mitigation but we're, we're kind of putting we're, we're kind of mixing things up a little bit oh man he's like really fighting at the bit there i can just catch it so uh, forgive me <laughs> if, if you will but um I'm I'm still unsure that this is actually a uh, um, part of the actual criteria as far as for approval. It's not the 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 part that's that's a part of the criteria is that they first meet and consult with ODFMW, which right. they absolutely have. They, they have. met the criteria they just have. by doing that alone. The fact that they've already got a mitigation agreement agreed upon mm -hmm. that's going to step beyond. The location of, of when you actually right. approve the because to date no one has come into and John may correct me but I don't recall any solar development ever having a mitigation agreement fully documented the location for implementation ever agreed upon prior to the planning commission's approval mm -hmm. and then even even subsequent uh, appeals on that, which some of the solar have been appealed to the board of commissioners um, and when we did up north was done when it got to us. For the ODF, or for the obsidian project, and that was three years in the making. Like they, but they were also going through an FSEC process. That's why that was. Let's that was not go into that one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's. But that. Yeah. But when it came to the planning commission, it wasn't agreed upon at the planning commission. Correct. When it came to the planning and commission, that's what it, it was that's not what agreed upon. Right. And that was very. So, would, is, there, is there part of the actual criteria that we would like to address? Is there any portion of the actual bits of the criteria that we feel like you know, have not been addressed, or maybe the Planning Commission made the wrong decision on out of their recommendations? Was there anything? I mean, I pointed out an error just that I had found based on the fact that the rebuttal from the applicant did not match up with the findings of the uh, Planning Commission. Um, and I would prefer to adopt the findings of the Planning Commission. But um, are there other portions of the actual criteria that the commissioners would still like to have more clarification on? I have no, nothing further. So, 
the draft that you guys have been given as, as potential findings, notice of decision, this 38 page document that we've been kind of going back and forth with. If you were to, th this is obviously written for approval. If you vary from that, um, either by adding conditions or denial, then you need to address criteria new findings for the location in that document. I mean, we can use an entirely different document, but. Um, Wait a minute, so go back again a little bit. What, what, what are you saying there? So, the document that's been prepared for you, which would become okay. a notice of decision um, and findings document, that was addresses all the criteria to date that uh, has been addressed by the applicant, by the plaintiffs, right. by yourselves, barring anything that, that might not um, have been new today. Anything that you guys vary from this, um, you know, if it's for denial, then we need to come up with the language for denial according to the, one of the criteria in here, or multiple criteria, whichever you find for, um, that would vary from this decision. Or, I guess, take a break, take a vote, and then come up with an entirely new um, one. But again, the information needs to be based on the record. Your decision needs to be based on the record. And that finding needs to be written supporting what's on the record. Well, again, so out of that document, again, that's what I was pointing out. That in in that document that they prepared for us, on on their recommend uh, on their request to the board of commissioners, basically on on our determination, um, you know, they had a piece in there that was in error to what the planning commission actually had found in their findings. So that needs to be adjusted right off the bat. That needs to be changed. Um, and then, uh, any conditions? And conditions, uh, you know, obviously, I think, you know, I mean, my big thing is always having a road use agreement in place. Yeah, the four things that you brought up before with the planning commission. Correct. And you know, because we, we've discussed it, and I think, you know, like, um, the ratio is not addressed. Primary all routes; document. those need to be th those need to be in the road use agreement. And, and really, this is this would be a condition um, of the actual approval itself. You know, uh, of an approval. Uh, also, the current road use needs to be within that road use agreement. Um, what the applicant's road use would look like. Uh, current conditions, proposed imp improvements and repairs, and um, you know, and, and and that would be you know a bullet point of you know if there, if there were major damages to a road. And I think this is this is broadly speaking on all road use agreements that I think that the county needs to consider for any kind of an application or approval. Um, you know, if there's heavy impact to a road, I think it needs to. Um, like, okay, if you're going to chip seal it, what portion of that and what percentage of the cost to, for the county to re-chip seal our road? Because we, we want to be the ones working on our road. We don't want someone else necessarily working on our road and doing it wrong. We know the road's best and we want to be able to use our people. If, whether it's, you know, 25% or something of the cost to chip seal a road or, you know, or do a reclaim if the road was badly damaged, as we have seen on some of these other applications in the past, some of these roads have been just absolutely pulverized uh, due to the heavy weights and everything. Um, our roads were built with cold mix back in the day and they weren't built for these heavy heavy loads um, and heavy traffic. Even if that's only for the period of time during construction of some of these sites. So road use agreement is, is a big one for me on a condition. Um, I think that you would have to adopt the Planning Commission's recommendation on lighting and fixtures being shielded. Um, one of the other things that the Planning Commission recommended to us as a condition was working working with, which is broad, um, uh, working with the Board of Commissioners on SIP and uh, on a SIP agreement. And I, I personally, uh, um, you know, I lean more towards a pilot agreement of 15 years at the maximum of 7,000 per megawatt. Because I'm, even if you can go down to 5,500, I think it needs to be at 7,000. And it's what the applicant has already stated in testimony 
that they would that they are looking to do and I think that needs to be a condition of approval even if that hasn't been fully worked out yet I think it's, it's a basic pilot agreement it would have to be a 15 years um, 7,000 locked in at that maximum if other counties want to go to 5,500 Instead of by solar more than us, that's perfectly fine. Too. I think it needs to stay at that in general. I think the right of way, you know, concerns that the board of commissioners has brought forward, right of way, it needs to stay off of the county road and the actual asphalt. It needs to stay off of our actual shoulder. I don't think it's appropriate to be grinding away the shoulders of our newly um, surfaced asphalt. Um, and I think that 25 acres that has been brought forward by the Board of Commissioners in that rural residential area needs to be moved elsewhere um, of whatever mitigation they plan on implementing. Um, I, and those are those are my <clears throat> my points of conditions that I've kind of jotted down. But and again, that's only if we decide that that's where we're going is towards a, an approval. Uh, I, I can pause it. Guys have other points. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, conditions as well, uh, but uh, I'm not going to go there until we decide on a condition of approval. Uh, on, on an approval, you mean? Yeah, if that's I'd rather just go. spare us from all that discussion until we have a decision. Okay. Is Are you wanting to make a decision? Or? I'll make a motion. Darwin? Well, just we can do this after the motion and everything, but just know that whatever decision is made, they still need to be included if you still want them. Because on an appeal, um, we can either you know accept that and reverse the decision, or they could uh, and not include those extra conditions. So if any conditions you want, still include them, even though it may be a, you know denial. You know what I'm saying? So so that if it when it moves forward. It's in the record that. Okay. Right. Let's continue on. Okay. I. Uh, if you're, if, I, I have a few issues though before we make a motion. Um, just real quickly, I think Commissioner Albertson does bring up a very good point on mitigation, um, pushing wildlife towards the highway, um, and whether or not the mitigation is actually appropriate. If wildlife is actually put in greater risk, do we have enough information to make that determination on whether or not? I know from what John here stated last so I can't like I can't find that in the record. I wish I really could. Again, though, if ODFW approved the habitat mitigation plan, yeah, it's I would consider it approved, right? Yeah. But we don't have to approve it. Correct. Our plan is so there's no net loss and the net benefits as well. So I'm going to go ahead and speak, go Mr. Chair. Yeah, Chairman. absolutely. Um, the fire plan is incomplete. Wildlife is, plan is incomplete and insufficient. No matter what they did, as far as gaining more ground, it's still going to push those animals to 395 Thomas Creek Road or uh, Rabbit Hill. It doesn't meet the rural residential plan, which we showed them. Transmission easement isn't complete. No road use agreement in place. No financial agreement has even been talked about with the commissioners. So we don't even know what we're getting into if we do. Um, and so I would be inclined to deny for those reasons. I, I have medications for conditions. I mentioned earlier about the Glenn Glare analysis that uh, if, if approved, uh, I would like a Follow up Glenn Glare analysis to be completed. And if uh, findings come that we have a definite Glenn Glare towards any of the residences or routes or airports, that uh, changes be made.
if the oh. habitat mitigation plan determines that they will build something less than 50 megawatts um, due to habitat mitigation acres. I have two priority areas that I would like to see solar panels reduced from. Number one is the second section on the west side of Rabbit Hill Road. And number two is the very north piece near uh, Stancliffe and Weevil House. Residences. Is that the one right along the Fountain's Creek? Yes, the very north west corner of the top. Mm -hmm. um, the fire protection plan, I already talked about that. Um, would like to request that EDPR uh, periodically provide some type of hazmat training for our RFDs to know how to fight solar panel fires to the best of their ability. I want assurance that no solar panels will be added to the future southwest corner of the project. I also want assurance, we haven't even talked about this today, but um, if EDPR chooses to sell it to another company, and I think we've discussed this in previous, um, that the decommissioning agreement is contingent to the sale of the site. Bonds need to be purchased if that's what's needed, equivalent to EDPR's de decommissioning purposes. I'd like to request a two to one habitat mitigation ratio. That it be met. In the durability uh, piece of it, that nothing's being built on any of the habitat mitigation areas. And that the habitat mitigation plan is met as a condition of permit. The applicant will develop and implement a detailed multi-year implementation plan that complies with the habitat mitigation plan and share the same with ODF and WM and County. Stated. Those are mine. For the record. Thank you. Now, just as a matter of process, I don't want to force the board into making a decision before the board is ready. Um, because the, we've had a lot of good discussion today, a lot of big topics, um, and there are some hard decisions um, based on our personal feelings sometimes, and that may conflict with the actual duty and the job that we actually have today and how we can actually intermingle those. So, I just want to be cognizant of board and make sure that um, I'm not presenting an ultimatum that a decision be made today. Again, I want to be thorough. I want to make sure that I'm giving everyone ample enough time to think about this. This is really been the first opportunity we've had as a board to have some of this discussion amongst ourselves and, um, and to kind of get a feel for where each other are at with uh, you know, the process because it's been different for each one of us. Each one of us has been able to visit with Darwin. Uh, we've been able to have some discussion with our legal counsel and go, going over the process and how we go about this. Uh, there's been a lot of concerns that we've 
ways that have been different because we look at things differently. Um, it's been really good for us to be able to have this discussion. And I don't know if uh, if the board feels it would be appropriate to let some time, you know, just, I, I'm, I'm throwing it out here for discussion too. Uh, I'm on the board if you guys want some more time to think about this, or if you're ready to make a decision today, if that's what you, you want to do. Um, I guess I'd like to hear from legal counsel one last time if you feel there's been any rocks that we haven't uncovered or that would put us in a position to where we're making a premature decision. Nothing that jumps out at me. I can't predict what goes on at Luba, but nothing that's happened today seems to go sideways. So I think you're, you would be well uh, within your authority to call for a vote. And if you don't get a second, um, then uh, the matter is continued, or you decide if you, um, uh, yeah, if you don't get a vote today, then you've got to make a vote at some point. So the whole yep. process would be for someone to call for a vote and see if there's a second, and then discuss whether or not to use the vote. To touch on something, Mr. Bailey, that you spoke on earlier at the um, opening of the meeting, um, because we've had a we've had a bunch of discussion about conditions, although we don't have a motion for approval, um, and conditions can really only be applied to an approval, not to a denial. Um, and if there were to be a denial, these condi conditions and these things that we feel would make it a better application would go out the window at that point, most likely, um, and could not be carried on to LUPA or any kind of an appeal process. The only way it would probably come back before us to apply conditions if it were would, would be if it were remanded to us. All right. Sure, I think we need to have Darwin explain the appeal process um, to the audience and to the if we go for the project, anybody can appeal it to Luba. So if, if, yeah, we, if we don't, the appellant can appeal it to Luba. Yeah, the applicant. Has applicant to, excuse me. Yeah, so anyone that submitted evidence in the record or testified at the hearings has an opportunity to appeal. And it's, the clock starts 21 days from the day we mail the decision out. Um, Luba has all that information. You contact them. The notice of decision would include how to contact them, um, and then you know we we'll wait 21 days to find out if there's an appeal or not. Um, now, also just on that, Darwin, that's not the only thing that can be appealed. The conditions could be appealed yeah. as well. Yeah, the conditions could be appealed to me. We've had cases locally where that's happened, and we would fall all the way up, and so that's why. Uh, if it's a vote for denial, you know, including those in the final document uh, as just an attachment that says, you know, we voted for denial based on these reasons, but, you know, these were conditions we would have had in place had it been approved. I think that's still something that should be in the record and in the final decision that's right. sent out. Which is why I think it, it's good that the commissioners share their conditions, you know, be, yeah, if there were to be an approval. Um, but um, because we could still because, use those, I believe. Right, we because we, and know. that's my point for putting some of these into the actual record itself and talking about them openly among the board. Um, there is one actually as a condition. Um, and it, maybe this is a point of, of clarity, uh, going over the site restoration and restoration of the site and the cost of restore, restoring the site, um, at what point, uh, you know, if we talk about a bond being put into place and everything else, and Mr. Alverson mentioned financial agreement, but we don't necessarily have all the pieces to yet. So, um, According to that's under Appendix H. If I read the state law correctly, 
they can't have an independent person do it. They have to have the state agency or tribe. And do what? Restoration. De determination. Determination is what restoration is going to cost. I gotta find information. Sorry, man. Three point three is retirement restoration actions. There is a place an uh, applicant for this notice of decision. It's roughly a 38 page document. It's like this. Yeah. I'm looking for my ORS because I already had it. Thank you. This is 660-023-0130. rule. And in there it has directly recommendation plan criteria and requirements. This document doesn't reference that in depth, but it will. It is reference of the fully in applicant's narrative, which is referenced in this one. So they have under a detailed cost estimate of project decommissioning and site restoration efforts, including the recycling or scrap value of the project components prepared by a licensed or professional engineer. So Okay, so everyone joining us on the uh, Zoom meeting, uh, <laughs> okay. we're about five minutes <laughs> to possibly losing you. Um, apparently, there is a notice out the local power company may be cutting the power. We do have a backup generator for this building. Um, it's a new um, system that we just kind of put in in the last couple of years. Uh, hopefully it will kick on, um, but uh, if we lose you and the feed goes dark, we could potentially be out for a few minutes, 15 minutes, or however long it takes power company to get things back rolling again. 
So, um, so just wanted to give you fair warning in case we do lose you because uh, they're set to do the power outage in five five minutes. Within the uh, AOR, I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, AOR. Oh, sorry. 660 Division 33 rule for solar. Um, letter M was nothing in the section shall prevent the county from requiring bond or other security plan for the developer or otherwise imposing on the developer the responsibility of returning the approval to solar power. And certainly, it's in there to have a reclamation plan. So, okay. and you know, what I asked, and they, they've, they've already got a letter from you know, the big companies. They've already got a letter saying that they would have it, and then it transfers, and that what you suggested as additional approvals respond to that. They want to ensure it transfers. So, it's the one that I forgot to put the OAR in the warehouse on it. It states, oh, it states on receipt of reasonable cost estimate from the, from the state agency or tribe, the applicant and the county may jointly enter into a cost reimbursement agreement administered by the county with. State Department of Fish and Wildlife, the State Historic Preservation Officer, <coughs> the State Department of Energy. And so what my concern is, is they used a private firm, and here it says you have to use a state agency or tribe. So is that in context for, for the bond? Restoration. Restoration? I'm not sure what, do you want to go on that? I'll we'll have to go back to... I'm not sure if that's possible. That's because I didn't have it on yeah. the top. There. I'm, wondering, I'm wondering if it's possibly the AFSEC rule from the original plan. That that Could be the some of the opposition before it. I didn't purpose. use any AFSEC stuff. No, I know you didn't, but the offer. Um, it's either an or else. You can find it, what you were talking about. Yeah. What I just read was the OER rule that's in, in the solar rule. Which sounds very contradictory to what you just read. But I'm not sure because the, the rules are definitely not the same. Like that's not sure if that's what this rule. Really I can find that. Yeah. yeah. So, I guess one of the things that's been brought up in public comment when it comes to um, so I think James, you know, I've already stated what I think. Barry's already stated what he thinks. Um, we have a really James felt like he stick, but I think he did one more thing. Yeah, I've, I've got I've got another condition here, and it's based around the actual restoration of the site. Is the and it's 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 not really a condition. It's it's a more of a clarification. I I think at this point it would be appropriate to make it a condition. Um, is the bond itself and uh, all, all the obligations are being placed on Blue Marmot. And uh, the question would be whether or not Blue Marmot actually would have the ability to put forward any um, dollars or has any assets that you know, what, what is it that Blue Marmot actually has to guarantee that they could actually afford the dollars to restore the site after they're not even able to make any money off of it? 
And what is the actual obligation that falls onto the county if the site isn't able to be cleaned up? And this has been a, and it's not necessarily um, something that we've made as a criteria. It's something that has been brought forward by our community many, many times on all of our other applications is based around uh, restoration of the site after um, it has reached the end of its life. What is the, um, what does that restoration look like? We've never actually gotten that with any of the applications that we have had in Lake County. We don't know what that process looks like. I don't think it's ever happened. No. But again, you know, this old school brings us back to, you know, okay, technology advances in, this, in a way where maybe it's lucrative for the applicant to just restore the panels and continue producing electricity and maybe at a more efficient rate. Um, but then again, you know, in a period of 35 years, um, it could be discovered that um, solar isn't necessarily, or at least the type of solar that we're utilizing, isn't necessarily the best form of uh, renewable energy, or isn't quite as green as some people think it is. And it could, things could shift, and suddenly solar isn't something that is uh, as lucrative. But we're still left, and liability on the county is where we could potentially be left with a large portion of land that we would have to clean up and restore in order to be able to put back to its original use. So I guess, you know, is the applicant Blue Marmot or is the applicant EDP? Who is actually taking on the liability of cleaning up the site? Is it Blue Marmot or is it EDP? And um, that's been, and I'm just, I'm referencing that and bringing it up because it's part of public comment numerous times. And, uh, Blue Marmot is under the conditional use permit. Right. But. Correct. So the bond would have to be taken out, connecting to Blue Marmot. No, to EDP is what I'm. Well, it would have to be, correct. It would have and to be Blue some, Marmot. Some company, yeah. So, but ultimately, that bond agreement is something that's going to have to be documented that we have record that we've got this assurance in place. When it's on file, if the project changes, then then we get an update to that. Um, but that bond itself is our assurance that, that this will be cleaned up. And this is the first time that, I mean, there may have been other um, land use decisions prior to mine or mine that, uh, that had some bonding, but we've, we've never required it before. But this, this is the assurance. So I would imagine that we'll have Jim Bailey take a look. Well, yeah, make sure that it, it covers, you know, the legal language within that document covers, you know, uh, reclamation, but also decommissioning prior to the 35 years, if that were to be the case. Yes. And so we just have legal counsel. When I, it gets me, I'll have them review it. If we wanted more, then I think we'll obviously ask for more. But, but the bond is something that they're not unfamiliar with. They've had in their company and they're just went before we had other projects that have had bonding so. right but i mean at this point in time um the estimated cost of um decommissioning the project just this year i mean it's estimated at about 1.2 million if scrap value is allowed so the net the net cost assumed the total cost of the retirement restoration is approximately 2.6 million minus approximately 1.4 million in scrap value recovery. So, you know, I mean, the, the restoration plan starts out with the project uh, will be constructed largely with recyclable and salvageable and reusable materials consisting of steel, aluminum, concrete, solar modules, or electrical cables and etc. all the way down to including large transformers. However, going back over here, you know, their actual um, recovery um, is only about 1.4 million out of the 2.6 million in cost of site restoration. So you know, that's that's a big amount of change for a company to eat. And it's, it's even more for a small rural county like us to eat. And so I guess, 
it's a it's more of a a concern on my part where you know we believe this with the future board of commissioners you know what is the actual liability on us and uh if say the company were to go bankrupt or not there anymore so i'm bringing that to the, the board of commissioners for just thoughts on that it's probably one of the bigger points that I, I neglected to leave out just because it's separated from all the others. So, if I Go ahead, can help you out on that, on reclamation on this one. I'm sure. The original um, conditions of approval um, were probably close to word for word as the new 38 page document. It had a little bit different variation to the, the language coming from the planning commission. So it said upon the date that is two years prior to the expiration of the time of the product being the cessation of generating power for a period of not less than nine months, the termination of any contractual agreement or, uh, to sell or otherwise provide power to a buyer or other off-taker, including any repowering or other extensions the applicant, the project owner at such time shall provide the candle the following. And then it's it's got word for word A, included on page 38, uh, it appears. That, that was in the staff report from the planning commission? Yeah, that was, that was in the conditions of approval that was attached to the recommendation. Uh, I'm not sure I've seen that, darling. I remember Sorry. reading that, but I'm not seeing that here right now in the staff report. What section was that again? So it was attachment. So it came through with the recommendation. Well, there's 13 pages of that <coughs> recommendation. All the recommendation, recommendation. There's an attached document to that, which is the condition of approval, which was another well, no, four page document. Well, conditions of approval are at the bottom of, what is it, page, page 6 of 13. Planning commission, commission recommendations, and they only have four. Yeah, that, that was the recommendation earlier to also address, but they had other conditions of approval, which if you look right above that, yes. condition of approval is attachment ZA, and that's the document. Um, okay, it's C attachment ZA for the yeah, list of so conditions. That, what I just read from you was ZA and it was number 14. Uh, uh, so the language is not the same that's in this, the 38 page document right now. So I just want to point that out. Um, this gives more timelines in the original from the planning commission, which Same on the same the same on the same on the same the same on the same on the same What is the slight variation from? So this is this is what the planning commission recommended to you. This is what I've now sent to you as information. Okay, right and I've seen this. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So I have. Just that. a matter of you want to include this language instead of this, or just like this. This just gives more dates and times and procedures. I think a little bit more depth. So this language might be also in which good. case I have both, this. Both might be yeah. yeah, hang on for a second. Yeah. I just want to make sure that I have. 
that uh, There it is. Yes. So you know that that's I'm sorry, I wish we could be more entertaining, but yeah. So for the sake of time, James, I think we need to either make a motion to accept or deny or take a little break. Okay. Have you, have you, are you satisfied with everything you've got to make sure that? Uh, I'm still, I'm, I'm still a little bit concerned about the bond and the restoration of the site. Um, I'm not entirely sure how to articulate um, a condition or if that's even within our purview. You can. I thought I heard from Darwin. It all, from what you said, that it would fall through no matter if ownership changed. So, and that, and there is, you there can is further on that. a financial assurance plan. Yeah, you could further um, add to that condition that's proposed here that says, you know, you know, prior to finalization of the sale, you know, there's um, financial assurance that's already in place for the new uh, owner. And that no finalization of the sale can happen until the county has has agreed to that. And I think essentially we're covered, but again, I reviewed the following document. But again, all the conditions that are in this document have to go to the next um, conditional use holder or exception holder of this permit if it were to sell. They have to comply with the conditions, but. It would be nice to have that document you know, shown to us right away. Or, I don't know how. You know, prior to sell would be the most appropriate thing in my mind, and, and it might be covered already in the condition. Prior to sale. So, yeah. similar to what we've got right now going on, where they, they can show that they're going to have it. You know, with an already built project, it's a little more difficult, but um, and I'm sure there's a good example out there of how that transition or you know, transfer happens appropriately. Um, putting the wording in there, it seems like it would cover us. I don't think it gives any um, non assurances to the developer. <clears throat> he doesn't intend to sell it anyway, so it's a good idea to mm -hmm. I would just point out on page 35, um, if this were a vote for approval, um, there's a good summary already in there of what you would actually be doing. If, it, if I could, may just read, you know, and we can obviously swap in denial, but the, um, the first part of, uh, on the bottom of decision and conditions of approval on page 35 gives, it, gives a good summary of where we're at, what, what the board would essentially be agreeing to, or again, you can, uh, we'll change that to denial if it's not agreeing to this, but the board also um, then has, you know, not only approves, but would amend and then give those um, details below on the top of page 36. So, um, and then add, obviously, in the motion of conditions that are asked to be added. If you want to review that, you can go through this. Seat. That's at the top of page 36. Yeah, the, the bottom of 35 and top of 36 is what I'm referring to okay. as, as what right. could be part of, you know, the motion, if you want to use that language, it's, it's there for you to do this, which is, seems like it covers everything. 
Well, and it, it does, you know, I mean, that itself covers, you know, some of my concerns about the, the differences between the staff report and the planning commission, uh, having some differences between you know, what's actually in this document too. But I, I still think that we need to make sure that we specifically say that we adopt the findings of the uh, planning commission on. And that's why this is here. And by reference to the numbers. Um, I think I'm, I'm pretty much ready for any of the work you guys want to do if you want to continue or if there is a motion ready to be made. I'm ready to make a motion. Yes, sir. <clears throat> we'll make a motion that the Lake County Board of Commissioners deny the approval of the Planning Commission recommendation regarding the conditional use permit and comprehensive plan amendment for both the exception concerning the application by Blue Marmot 9 LLC for the siting of commercial utility facility for the purpose of generating power for public use and sale. So you deny it? Second. Okay, motion been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Is there a clarification on that on the uh, reasons for denial? Yes, I will have a list okay. written up. Um, what I have right now, like I said earlier, the fire plan is incomplete. The fire pipe plan is incomplete and insufficient. Doesn't meet rural residential plan. Transmission easement is incomplete. No route road use agreement in place. No financial agreement has uh, been talked about with the commissioners. Uh, 215.416, that would be an ORS number. Um, 4A, a county may not approve an application if the proposed use of the land is found to be in conflict with the comprehensive plan. Right, that's why I have so far. County may not approve an application if the proposed use of the land is found to be in conflict with the comprehensive plan of the county and the other applicable land use regulations or ordinances and provisions approved. Approval may include such conditions as authorized by statute or county legislation. Um, and that consists of uh, rural residential and the farm residential lands out there. Um, well, let's see, the wildlife don't have farm residential on the site. Proposed. Yeah, but it's only proposed, it's not currently going that way. Right. But it goes against our plan. It's in our plan. Okay. If, if I'm wrong, you can correct me later. Okay. Um, <laughs> wildlife plan, I'm really a stickler on that. I really believe people and animals will get hurt with this plan. I truly believe that. I believe it'll have a great impact on that animal group. And if not lost altogether. Um, it does not meet 197.732, section 2C. It does not meet OAR 660-033-130-excuse me. OAR 660-033-0130. Thirty-eight, and I'll have the rest of it here too. So that's what I have so far. But there'll be more. Those are your reasons. I'll have to type the reason. Okay. James, I. Uh, sure. So I wrote two decisions today, uh, one for approval, one for denial. 
and I'll go ahead and read the decision. It was, you know, a very tough decision. I want to share my thoughts leading up to my decision regarding EDPR's request from Lake County Commissioners for conditional use permit and a comprehensive plan amendment for goal three exception to establish approximately a 600 acre photovoltaic solar project in Lake County for the purpose of generating power. This is a difficult decision for many reasons. First of all, I feel the people who live near the proposed site, I feel for the people who live near the proposed site. No one wants solar panels to be next to your home. They are not natural and they look ugly. They have, we have heard from many of the landowners who enjoy wildlife, the wildlife around them, uh, great expansive views of the Goose Lake Valley and all the natural beauty that it provides. The applicant, Blue Mormon, definitely had a roller coaster ride with many citizens of Lake County. They started with five 10 megawatt sites, with four of the sites being on irrigated land. Blue Marmon also held their first online meeting to share their plan, and that did not go well, and immediately lost the trust of many citizens who were able to participate. They quickly learned from our Lake County citizens that irrigated land in a short, is in short supply in the county and vital to the local economic success with crops and livestock use. Blue Marmon received permission from the power purchaser to move everything to one location. At this point, I wish Blue Marmot would have collaborated with the county for what many would see best for the Dubrow project site. But no, we received a plan. We were told that they were running out of time and could discuss design location and options. I felt that it was done with little regard for the people who live next to the project area and went against what they said they would do to collaborate and work with local citizens. Blue Marmot did do their homework, and they were able to get their habitat mitigation plan approved with ODFW to meet the agency's required minimum conditions. This is puzzling because we all see the use of wildlife in this area and heard many times from the citizens living in the area of all the antelope and mule deer use for winter range, grazing, and as well as regular use. It feels as though wildlife in the future will be restricted to travel and push closer to Highway 395. With that being said, it's the board's role to determine whether the project as proposed complies with applicable approval criteria or can be made to comply the approval criteria with any necessary conditions of approval. Blue Marmot was willing to move the original project sites off irrigated land they were also willing to have the project approval made by the county, us as the commissioners, versus uh, going through the state jurisdiction. Blue Marmon also was willing to move panels out of the southwest corner of the project to reduce impacts to local landowners who have solar panels on three sides of their property. <clears throat> I feel that it is important to, <clears throat> it has been important to scrutinize Blue Marmon's plan to better find out what kind of partner the county would potentially deal with. I'm not a fan of solar panels in general, and I don't want to see solar panels near where Lake County citizens live. I am also limited to what is before us to make the decision on. I am ruling to deny this project as I feel it conflicts with the county comprehensive plan in regards to how specific property was designed to be used. It was identified in the plan as range as well as agriculture land. Range land has not been reviewed and adequately discussed. Livestock use has been a precedent for the past 19 plus years, probably longer than that, according to the Clark, to the Maxwell family, and uh, the pasture that permanent uh, dry land pasture that has been planted. Um, is still used today by the grazing that is done there. This particular property, property is also identified in the county comprehensive plan for non-farm dwelling development. Because I feel the project from Blue Marmot has a conflict with the Lake County Comprehensive Plan and ORS 215.416 referring to permitted application rules that state the county may not approve an application if the proposed use of the land is found to be in conflict with comprehensive plan that the county 
and other applicable land use regulation or ordinance provisions. For this reason, I feel the project will also have adverse effects on current residents within close proximity and will have long-term adverse effects on current rangeland and agricultural practices. It will also make it more difficult for existing farms and ranches in the area to continue operation due to diminished opportunities to expand, purchase, or lease farmland, farm and rangeland. For these reasons, I will deny the application. And I can submit that if needed. Yeah, I, that's just a point that while we're having discussions, we have a motion and a second on the table. If we could have that included, Darwin, mm -hmm. as uh, an attachment. Uh, at least, I'm not sure the appropriate way to bring that in. It's, a, it's not part of the original motion, but it is additional comments. So I think it should be a, an attachment along with the motion. It's right. And so any appeal, the audio is going right. forward anyway. So having the attachment as a word document makes it that much easier. Absolutely. From the transcript purposes. Um, are there any additional? Uh, did you have uh, any other additional? Uh, Reasons for denial beyond the statement that you read within the. Uh, Not at this time, no. Okay. It's possible, I'm not, but I'll have it all in writing. So, from what I still see. Um, I'm going to just do a process check here. Uh, Mr. Bailey, um, anything jumping out at you right at the moment for legal content? Only if you haven't actually taken a vote yet. We have not taken a vote, no. Well, one other part, just knowing that I'm going to have to mail this out and start that 21 day clock, I, I just want to know like, when I'll get that. What do you need as soon as possible? Today would have been preferable, but uh, you know. I can get it to you. I, I, at this point, I wouldn't mail anything out today anyway, so yeah, but you know, maybe Friday. But you won't be here Friday? No, but I'll have it okay. before then. I'll have it by the end of the day. Okay. And then you'll just get it out on Friday then. Yeah. yeah. Any further discussion? Um, I'll call for a, a vote. Um, all those in favor. Uh, all those in favor of the denial, please say aye. 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 Okay. And nays, I vote nay. And I will expound on that. Is I don't agree with all of the reasons for denial. Um, there's a number of them that I, I just don't agree on. I don't, I don't think that they're applicable to the actual um, criteria, and I think it's centered too closely around what we individually feel. And uh, so you expound on which ones? Well, I can expound on this. <clears throat> We've never denied an application based around any of these reasons. And this is not the only solar that we have in Lake County that is on range, A1 or A2. We don't deny that solar application because it's on range only. And so it's what it's largely sounding like. So maybe. I know to say that. Okay, could you expand on that? that we, which sure sounded like that was exactly why, one of the reasons why. I, said, I stated that rangeland has not been ad adequately reviewed and discussed. Okay, maybe that was what you had said. Rangeland got really discussed, really got brought forward today. Again, so again, I, again, this is your reason for it. Yes, and, and again, I feel that, uh, you know, based on the actual rules and the criteria that we have here in Lake County at the current time, um, and within the state of Oregon, solar is an allowable use on agricultural land. It, it's just, that's, that's the state of the norm. And so, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to vote with the board on this one. And uh, plus, I feel like uh, there was a lot of conditions that we left off the table with this that could have addressed a lot of the concerns that were brought forward as, as reasons for denial. Um, and those are no longer applicable and likely won't be. So I guess we will 
allow that to go forward. Um, so for the record, um, two for uh, a denial and uh, one against the denial at this point. For the reasons stated. Um, Mr. Bailey, is there anything else? No, you can not um, even on the agenda for the meeting. All right. Uh, with that being said, uh, the time being um, just 3 o'clock, we will adjourn today's special session.